Welcome back to another Autosport Q&A where we put your questions, the Autosport fans' questions, to our esteemed guests. Now, you can get your questions in on YouTube, on Instagram, as well as on our call-outs on autosport.com. Joining me this time, I'm delighted to have, I say with a wry smile, my two very sleepy-looking friends after the Las Vegas weekend. I've got Hayden Cobb, hello to you, and JBL, a.k.a. Jake Box or Leg. Or is it the other way around? I never know. The other way around. It's not. It's <laughs> not. I think you're always a.k.a. Jake Box or Leg, because yeah, we yeah, never yeah. call you Jake Box or Leg. How are you both, Jake? Uh, very good, thank you. As you say, knackered after uh, Vegas, because it's on a very silly time zone if you're working from the UK, but... We, we persist, we shall endure, and that's why we do this. Endure and enjoy exactly. liquid gold, this isn't it. Hayden, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm all right, thanks. Recovered from, yeah, pretty heavy weekend, but it's all good. How are you? I'm all right. Actually, I had a cold. I don't want to dwell on it. I had a cold. I've got over it. Glad. But a little, a little behind the, the scenes for you, I didn't set my alarm for both qualifying and the Grand Prix. Oh, now, no. you'd think Whoa. that I'd have... I know. Oh, well, I, <laughs> No, because I've got a two-month-old baby. So uh, <laughs> I was the alarm? up with plenty of time in hand. So I was probably up at three o'clock in the morning waiting the start of the Grand Prix, which started at... Six. Six, yes. Yeah. So I had three hours just to get ready for the Grand Prix. So that was a joy. Um, got a lot of questions to get through. Quick fire, maybe. Going to delve into your brains and see what you think here from the amazing questions put to us by our readers, viewers, listeners. It's from some James on Instagram. He says, how high do you now rank Verstappen on the all-time list now that he's, a, he's won his fourth straight title? Hayden? Yeah, well, we were talking about this on Monday with Chief Editor Kevin Turner um, because he's done this overview previously. So getting his feedback on it, and he can't be here today, was was useful. And he, I think he's a fair judge of it in terms of saying that uh, there's a lot of criteria to go through it um, in terms of where you rank the greatest of all times in their own sort of list. And he's put Verstappen in sort of the lower reaches of the top 10, which for a four-time world champion, um, you'd think that's probably a bit tough. But it, in terms of dialing it through... He has uh, won all his titles with the same team, which the likes of Hamilton, Schumacher, all, they've all won multiple teams. Um, let's be honest, he has won most of the titles in the same rule set. I know 2021 was, was technically a different rule set, but let's not go into that situation, <laughs> how he won that title for, for now. Um, and he didn't, throughout all those title wins, he hasn't had a teammate that's put up, like, put up any kind of fire in Sergio Perez. So... Uh, in terms of those in equal machinery, he's not had a, a contest on that. Uh, for, for me, personally, I think, granted, recency bias does put me into it, but I would say he's certainly not in the, yet, in the Hamilton, Schumacher, Fangio top bracket. And then, yeah, your, your Stewart's, Clarks, Prost, Senna's, Lauders, and sorry if I've forgotten anyone else, but in that sort of ilk, he's probably in and around there. But I've already named seven, eight drivers there, so I'm not probably too far off what, what Kevin said. Um, but again, he's still got plenty of time to be climbing be climbing the ranks for that with multiple titles. I think I'd have to agree. I think you'd have to say definite top 10. Um, top five, potentially, it's just, it's so subjective as well. Like you, you Kev likes to come up with different formulae and that kind of thing, and you can rank things based on you know how do you weight winning it with the same team how do you weight the cars and that kind of thing but everything is still ultimately subjective with how you do that um and so to us we might suggest okay well maybe Hamilton's in there Schumacher Senna and then who's the rest of your top five maybe Jim Clark maybe Jackie Stewart maybe Nicky Lauda maybe Alain Prost do I do I rate Verstappen with them I think you would have to re reappraise that question after his career in F1 is over um, and look at it a little bit more with distance to, to, to how he goes about things because there's always still room to improve as well. Um, there's so many things that he's fantastic at, but there's also a few things that he doesn't need to do as a racing driver. Well, that's what I was going to kind of press you on a little bit here. You know, what what is stopping him, in your opinion, from being in the top three or the top five then? Is it the fact that he is what aggressive on defence because I mean Senna was always aggressive under defence so was Michael Schumacher Lewis Hamilton was to a degree but maybe not to the extent of Schumacher or Senna so what is it that's that's holding Verstappen back in your opinion because whenever we say anything that could be deemed as slightly non-pro Max Verstappen and let's face it we are all pro Max Verstappen here when we ever we say something like that you know the, the internet ignites so what is it in your opinion that's holding him back? Obviously it's quite a sort of clever approach to how he wants to go racing and ever since we've had this 
spearhead at the apex thing. He's utilized that to the maximum. But there's just this lack of, let's say, you want to concede now because you might win a little bit later. There's not really that much thought behind the move. It's not like a snooker player that's always thinking three or four balls ahead. When Verstappen is in that moment, there isn't that forethought at the moment. And he kind of needs to weigh up consequences and think, okay, if I do this, what's going to happen here? I think that's the thing that's lacking. Otherwise, you know, raw speed, he's got that immense car control. He's got that, just this sort of way that, Unlike a lot of other drivers, he just knows exactly when to push the tyres at the right time. You never hear him come over and go to the radio, or very, very rarely, saying that I've run out of tyres before everybody else. That just doesn't happen to him. But I think it's just that really aggressive racecraft, it goes over the edge sometimes and he needs to just rein it back a little bit. But on that point there, Hayden... That, I don't know. In my opinion, Max Verstappen knows exactly what he's doing at all times. So is that part of the problem that he's he, he knows what he's doing? He knows he's outbreaking himself. He knows he's going to drive himself off the track. And in doing that, he's going to drive others off the track. Is that a problem for us watching on? Or is that what is actually makes Max Verstappen so damn strong that he does these things premeditated almost? Good question. I think it's a bit of both in terms of, yeah, he's probably the most aggressive driver there's potentially ever been in, in Formula One. Um, but he does everything with a purpose and it's sort of, he's well at angling it as um, this is somebody else's problem in terms of, so yeah, when he was aggressively defending from Norris over those sort of Austin, Mexico races, it was always with the, the mindset of if Norris is going to go around the outside or if he's going to put himself in a risky position, he'll have to deal with the consequences, not me. Happened as well in, in Austria when they came to blows. Norris was the one who didn't finish Yes, Verstappen got a penalty. Yes, he got damage. Yes, he didn't win the race, but he finished fifth, still banked t- uh, 10 more points than, than Norris did that day when arguably they would have finished first, second uh, in other circumstances. So, yeah, it, it can be, I think, to his critics, it's his biggest weakness, I guess you could say. But to his to his fans, it's sort of what, what drives people to him. And I think that's that whole contrasting um, style uh, you either love him or you hate him type thing. And that's why he's probably so, uh, particularly in the social media age, divisive. I think if social media had been around when Senna was <laughs> was driving, I think we probably would have seen something very, very similar for, for similar reasons. And yeah, I think that's probably why where we are now in his current career, yes, no one can, can fault that he's a fantastic driver, but those petulant moments, those... Um, calculated moves you could say which we have seen in others as we mentioned before probably mean that he's not like the the perfect racing driver so far pure race craft also was revealed recently christian hornaba saying that he's actually it got under his skin more the criticism got under max's skin more than maybe he thought initially and and that's interesting from a championship point of view imagine michael schumacher giving a jot about the fact he smashed into damon hill could you imagine that Max, and it, it, it's that, isn't it? Michael Schumacher's skin was so thick, it was like a rhino. But Max doesn't seem to have that if apparently he's being, he's, he's, he's being affected. I think so, uh, and I'm sure you kind of see this in what, you know, when we're at races, if there's a question that he sort of gives relatively short shrift. Um, he, he's quite defiant in the face of that. And you can see that he gets a little bit defensive in the sense that he'll give sort of quite snarky one word answers, that kind of thing. Thankfully, I've never asked him a question where he's done that. But uh, when you know, you know, when it's coming, um, you know, when someone's really up to ask him a question in a press conference and he's already sort of sinking into his seat going, right, how am I going to deflect <laughs> this a little bit? Um, I, obviously, I wasn't around for when 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 Michael was racing and, and other people like that, but you didn't tend to see that. He thought about it and was usually quite measured. Um, it was very rarely a sort of like a little terrier barking back. It was never like that with Schumacher. You do get that to some extent, I think, with, with Lewis as well, if he doesn't like a question. Um Max is sort of obviously you know you saw with Singapore and that kind of thing it was clear he was in a situation he didn't like and he decided to I don't know enjoy himself a little bit with it yeah yeah it's I mean we're going to stick with Max for the next question but it is interesting I think that you know the thick skin we always think of these drivers that are the very very top of their game any sports person at the very top of their game that they must be completely impervious there's no way you can affect them and yet maybe it's not quite so simple as that um D5 Pasadena 
on YouTube says, if Max was racing for McLaren and Lando Norris was racing for Red Bull, who would have won the 2024 driver's title? Now, I think we have different opinions on this. What do you go? I, I do think Verstappen wins it regardless of what car he's in. But obviously with this hypothetical, we're assuming he's been at McLaren for uh, a little while in terms of he would make the team like he has Red Bull, i.e. his own, everything that he uh, wants, he, he gets, whether it's the sort of the teammate situation. So I think papaya rules wouldn't even be a, a thought in McLaren's minds if he if Verstappen was their driver. Um, in terms of strategy calls, he would <laughs> lambast and say, look, you make me number one and, and we win every race possible um, and, and go, go from there. That's not to say I think Norris couldn't win in a Red Bull, but we haven't seen it it's been it is his own his first title fighting campaign it's fair to say that and he's learned a lot he's been very open about that um but we haven't seen him basically do the same things that Verstappen has been able to do to win this title with two rounds to spare I think it's the whichever driver's in the Red Bull that wins it and I'll explain why I, I do kind of agree with what Hayden is saying and I think that Max goes into McLaren he does make it his own team you don't have any of the outside lobbying to give Piastri a slightly better deal within the team. Um, you have everybody there gravitating around, around one driver, and that's therefore I think it's going to be closer. Um, but I think Red Bull was just so strong at the start of the season, so I think Norris wins all the races that Max won. Perez is still, you know, very clear number two, so Norris no longer has to worry about asserting himself because he already has. He's already in that position. And I think he deals with the drop in form in the mid-season a little bit better because he's more used to being in that position. I think the when the car was really, really struggling for balance, Norris usually has spent, I think, the last three years with a McLaren where he struggled with the balance and he's done pretty well with it. Verstappen seems to be a little bit more sensitive to it. And and still, he's, he did fantastically well and he got great results in the mid-season, had a terrible race in Hungary and he still came, what, like fifth? Um, and there's been other races like that, but I just think Norris deals with that a little bit better because, again, as I say, he's used to it for the last three... He's been dealing with it for the last three years. And then, ultimately, you get to this sort of like running towards the end of the season where the Rebel is a little bit better. Um, again, I think it's so close, um, but I think Verstappen is maybe a little bit frustrated by the McLaren mistakes as well. The team is guilty of throwing away as many results as perhaps Norris has. Um I do think it still it goes down to the wire rather than being wrapped up now, but I still think Red Bull ends up winning drivers' championship with Norris. So you're saying Verstappen wins either way, either way, no matter what. Yeah. And you're saying Norris if he's in the Red Bull because of the because of it's the Red Bull car and because Norris is better at dealing with the pressure. I yeah, I, I think it's got to be Max personally. I, I think but only one of you's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good it's a good question, and it's. It's something we'll never know the yeah. answer to. That's the whole oh, that's point right. of yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and, and likewise, with the whole teammate situation, how does Verstappen get on with a Piastri who, in this hypothetical, push, let's say he pushes him closer. Let's say he has that issue. Let's go back to the Italian Grand Prix and Piastri's coming alongside Verstappen in this McLaren scenario. Does he throw him in, the, not throw him in the wall, a bit extreme, but does he, yeah, does he basically run him off the road a little bit like he's done with his rivals over the years? So what does Norris have to do then to, to maybe your, your opinion, what does Norris have to do then to, to be equal to Verstappen? Has he got to get a bit more uh, feisty, a bit more aggressive and a bit more, I don't care what you're going to do, I'm doing my own thing? I think on, on the front foot, and that's why the start of next season is going to be fascinating watching at McLaren because everything goes back to zero. Therefore, Norris knows he'll need to be on the front foot immediately to basically be considered the number one driver at McLaren and not have this equal treatment with Piastri if, if he's going to fight for the title because it's he's going to need all the advantages coming his way at like because he knows Verstappen will have that at Red Bull almost regardless of who his teammate may or not be from from next year. So is that that is that is that cutthroat approach? Um, he's certainly got the racecraft and when things are right, we know he can produce flawless performances. Singapore was probably... Yeah, a very clear example of that. But also banking those races of when everything's not quite going well. I, w I would say Verstappen's done pretty well with that year. That's the sort of biggest credit I can give to him this season is when that Red Bull has not been behaving like he liked. And yes, he's been furious over the radio, furious to anyone that would come near him. He, You look at his results, take obviously Australia out because that was a mechanical 
no fault of his own, his lowest finishing position is sixth place. And that's with a car that's been fourth, third quick, quickest in, in terms of the grid. So he's been hauling that car to results it shouldn't really be having. And, and Norris is going to need to be doing that if it is that tight battle between Ferrari, Red Bull, um, McLaren and possibly Mercedes. What have we, we've seen over the years, haven't we, that the champions whoever they happen to be, the champions at Vettel, Hamilton, Schumacher, go through the list of these people, but uh, Alonso even at that point, but they have always been very critical on Team Radio. They, their demands are so extreme and Verstappen brings that, doesn't he? He has this demand straight away. Why? He's always asking this why. And I think that that's, um, that's something that probably sets him above Norris. Norris has got to learn, surely, if he's going to become that champion. Um, Sam on Instagram says... We've now we've had two years of Vegas on the calendar. How would you rank the American races? Now I, I don't know if he means the American races in the calendar or the American races in order of the American races. So interpret however you wish. I th- I'm going to go with American races as American races, and purely because uh, a few weeks ago I did a piece ranking all of the circuits that were on that have been used in the US. I Great think, read, by the way. So I, and it was all of them throughout F1's history. And I, I believe I put Watkins Glen first, which I don't think will be entirely controversial. I think everybody has a very fond spot for that circuit. I think as a circuit itself, Vegas isn't particularly interesting. It is there to use the strip in its, not in its entirety, but use as much of it as it can. And then everything has kind of been built around that within the confines of the city. But actually, I think because of the conditions, because of cold weather catching everybody on the hop, I think it's actually produced some pretty decent races. So that's in the middle of the three. Miami, it's great to go to. Um, it's really cool to see it, but it's just, it's not been great. The races there haven't been stunning. I don't think you can look at it and go, this was, this will be one of the vintage Formula One venues in the future. It will go the way of perhaps Phoenix or Detroit or something like that. Uh, um, it won't be entirely fondly remembered. As we're coming on to the circuit of the Americas, uh, you can, uh, you're can you already grinning and you know what I'm going to say. It produces f- some fantastic races and this year was no exception. But as a circuit, I absolutely hate it because I think it's the laziest piece of design on the planet. It's an absolute travesty that it works. So it more annoys you that it works? Yes, but, exactly. Right, okay. why, why does it annoy you that it works? Why does it annoy me? Because it shouldn't. It is basically, it's the maggots and Beckett's at home leads into, we have Istanbul turn eight at home, separated by some long straights and some sort of tight corners. It's in the middle of nowhere. The scenery is atrocious. The <laughs> wow. car park, I remember like the first year in 2012 when it was first racing there, it was just beige and grey. And so they've painted all of these stars and stripes on it to sort of pretty it up and make it look good. But it's just you have every year you have these track limits issues, far too much runoff. There's no deterrent there. The turn 14, 15 switchback bit, that's quite good. I do actually quite like that. But the rest of it I really hate because it's just worse corners. Uh worst versions of corners that are good um and again i it does annoy me that it produces good races because i don't feel it justified in my rage against it however i will put it top of these three circuits despite all of that despite all of that i was just thinking maybe you should get an opinion on this (laughs) oh (laughs) but okay hayden i mean yeah i mean because it because it works it annoys JBL, which says a lot. But what about yourself then? I can hear the Circuit America's hearts breaking from here, yeah. hearing all that. You just said they've got or copied the best corners of circuits around the world, put it in one circuit, which is the whole point of whenever you're um, 10 years old and you're trying to dry, uh, draw your fantasy racetrack and you take inspiration from that, you do exactly what yeah, Coach has done. A, okay, so. but let, as a 10 year old, you probably have your favourite books and you try and chop and change them and put your into your own little story. You can't write a good book by stealing bit. Well, okay, you, you, maybe can. you can steal inspiration <laughs> from, but directly lifting and doing worse versions thereof. That's what I don't like about so, it. We're all entitled to our own opinions. I love Kota for, for pretty much the same reasons you've just <laughs> mentioned, but saying that's why it's good. And it's sort of in a, in a heartland of, of, of motorsport. Um, it, it's been on the calendar over 10 years now, getting close to its sort of 15th anniversary. And it's, it's stuck. That is one thing you would say for Formula One in America hasn't been able to achieve. And this was before Cota was a, was a, 
Heartland for Formula One before the Liberty Media takeover. Um, and they've grown and thrived despite the emergence of Miami and Vegas. It is worth saying that Circuit Americas is is very different. It has a different sort of uh, attraction vibe to the other two, which is its massive strength. And I think that's probably why I, f- I favour it more. It's a bit more uh, hearty, a bit more authentic, let's say. I am also not a massive fan of street tracks looking all the same and feeling all the same, which ultimately, my, for me, Miami and Vegas are very, very similar, but one's in May in the daytime and one's at a weird night time in, in freezing cold temperatures. Um, and for the European mind, can't comprehend having a fake marina in Miami with the boats <laughs> and then going down the strip and going, oh, there's a hotel. And I'm like, fine, but whatever. It's not it's not my uh, English cup of tea. So Kota is your favourite and then the other two are your least favourite and there's no one in the middle. Uh doesn't really matter yeah, if there's not one yeah, in the I'll middle. Yeah, I'll go with that, yeah. yeah? yeah. You like one, you dislike the other two. Yeah. Fine, okay. For the absence of doubt in that ranking, I put Kota third with, so what was it? Watkins Glen was first. This is so bothering Long you. Be- is you Long yeah, Beach yeah. was second. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I was furious. Okay, well, <laughs> and if you haven't checked out the article, make sure you do. Just get a little search on autosport.com. I'm sure you'll find it just there. Um, now, uh, let's have a look. Question about Carlos Sainz from Barry on Instagram. Was Carlos Sainz right to ignore playing the team game in Vegas like he has for most of the season? I quite like this. Go for it, JBL. Uh, I'm going to dampen everything down here and just say I think it's a little bit of a mountain out of a molehill, to be honest with you. Okay. I mean, let's look at the situation as it was. Um, Sainz was lobbying for a stop for a few laps at that point and by the time he'd come in his tyres were already grained so he was already struggling he was already irritated Leclerc stopped a couple laps later than he did so we're in a situation where Sainz had the warmer tyres Leclerc was just ahead it just makes sense for Leclerc to move over Sainz to go through and then for for Charles to to build his tyre temp slowly because he'd already ruined the first set by pushing too hard on them he needed to bring them in and then he might have this opportunity for a challenge later in the race. That's that's the sensible solution. But there was this sort of weird message of don't put Charles under pressure. Arguably, science could suggest, well, I didn't because I just, <laughs> just stuffed straight past popped him. it down the inside. <laughs> jobs are good and job done. And I think it's that old. I, I kind of thought Ferrari had got over the unclear radio messages. Usually, it makes more decisive calls than that. Or it certainly has this season. But it was a very, you could interpret it very differently from from car to car. So I understand why both drivers were irritated by it. But again, I think it's just sort of, it's a fuss about nothing and it didn't really need to happen, to be honest. Yeah, the, the only case I can say of signs having sort of regrets or not thinking that was the wisest move is if we look into the future and say he's looking for a return to a, to a top team and no disrespect to Williams, but in this scenario that they aren't doing that and say Lewis Hamilton either wins his titles or retires at Ferrari or whatever, and then they need another driver. If he does start burning those bridges, it's potentially going to be a bit problematic, but only adding to the fact that he's been on the market all season. Mercedes looked over him, went went for Antonelli. Uh, Red Bull, <laughs> doesn't matter what they say, they do have a seat available um, and have overlooked him f- for that. And it seems that whether it's Verstappen sort of pressuring on that or whoever. Um, and that sort of leaves him very limited in terms of options for there. I don't actually blame him for, for, what, yeah, for what happened in Vegas. and um, He's racing for himself. And I think saying that he's not played the team game all season is a bit harsh. I, I feel like he's been, for throughout his career, a good team player. So I'm not sure I quite agree with that. But yeah, at the end of the day, he's got two races left for, for Ferrari. He's fighting for himself and... Yeah, as soon as we get into 2025, he's a Williams driver, so he'll be taking them on. I think I, mean, I think the question uh, that Barry's put it is that he is saying he's played the team game for most of the season, but ignored it on this one occasion. And you actually think, well, he's got, at this point, he had three Grand Prix. He was in that third Grand Prix from the end of his, his career at, F- at Ferrari before he moves on. So there is a bit of who knows when he's going to be on the on the step again. Who knows when he's going to get any, any silverware to hold above his head. So there is that racing driver instinct, isn't there, that Soji, I'm going to do what I want because I am... Uh, you know, a testosterone fueled racing driver. There is a bit of that going on there. And maybe that does raise his stock uh, to other teams. And you said that it might hamper him, but it might not hamper him. It might help him. Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, it, it's just ultimately, 
again, we don't know where Williams is going to be in the next few years. And we know it's a long term project. We know their resources on 2026. So likely next year, unless something ridiculous happens, he's not going to be standing on that podium next year. So he's going to want to sort of have one for the road before he slings his hook and moves to Grove. So, um, yeah, you're going to take it. If the opportunity is there, you're going to take it, aren't you? Two more Grand Prix to go. Let's see if he'll stay on the top, on the, any of those podium positions those last two times. What Your instincts that, that Carlos Sainz will, just, will do this again for the final two Grand Prix just to maximise his, his career at this stage? Or will he start to, to sit back and help Leclerc? Um, I think if they're fighting over third and fourth like they were in Vegas or a similar position then then yes he'll probably do the same thing he will be very aware that Ferrari are fighting for the Constructors World title and therefore jeopardising the points that they gained um, in those scenarios I, th- I think he's a smarter driver than than taking points off the team for, for that reason yeah I think <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, it's hard to disagree isn't yeah, it exactly. yeah exactly ultimately you know Constructors Championship on the line he knows he's not he's not going to put that in jeopardy but if there's a chance where he's very clearly the faster car which he was in that situation then he's going to take the take the take the move only 24 points separate them from that top spot it's going to be very very tight isn't it uh, staying kind of in the same ballpark really Cameron on Instagram has says has the hype train we don't have hype train mentioned often enough do we has the hype train cooled on Franco Colapinto after three crashes in the last two weekends uh for me no, but I'm looking at it from a business point of view and all the sponsors and all the fanfare and so all the money that he still will attract and still will hold regardless of where he goes in in the future. Um, granted, his, yeah, his recent crashes haven't sort of helped his cause as was the case, but it does seem also worth adding as, as a few people have, have pointed out that um, Albon, Sergeant before him, and it seems anyone who jumps to that Williams has done a lot of crashing. There's been a lot of, of heavy offs in that car. Um, it's fair to say the Vegas one, I think, was certainly driver error and car error. But, um, but regardless, it, it clearly doesn't seem an easy car to drive. Um, he's still put in a solid performance in, in Vegas, despite the situation. Um, so I don't think it changes that much, but <laughs> we'll see. He's got two more races. Maybe he could have. But in terms of the Red Bull connections, maybe it has called that situation in terms of a race seat for 25 um i think ultimately when the discussions of potentially putting colapinto straight into the lead red bull team after a couple of that was always very premature anyway and i think people got carried away just because you know obviously he'd done quite well um in the opening races i was really impressed with his monza race out of you know just being hurled in but i think This is something that all rookie drivers face as well, is that if you're shielded quite a lot from a lot of the minutia of Formula One, where you can just, you're given the opportunity of, okay, go out and learn the car. We'll give you what you need to know. Um, Do X, Y, Z. They can usually do quite a good job. You give a driver a sort of setup where it's really easy to handle. It might lose some, some, some speed overall, but then you try and ease the driver into setups that are, bit more difficult to handle um something that ultimately is going to deliver more pace but that's when they also start to become more involved in setup rather than going oh i'm feeling this and the engineers deal with deal with it they'll go oh i'm doing this therefore i think we need to i don't know take a bit of toe out or we need to change the anti-roll bars or something like that when the driver starts to become more involved they can sometimes get lost a little bit as well and also rookies crash that's just the nature of the beast and i'd be worried that if he didn't um you're there in your first season to find the limit. And I think the fact that if if Red Bull's interest on him has cooled, if they're now not thinking about, I don't know, promoting one of their RB drivers and putting him in an RB, if they're not thinking about that now, um, then I think ultimately that's their failing, that they think they can judge a driver based on two or three appearances. I, I could go on a tangent about the Red Bull driver development programme, Um, in that it's produced two really, really, you know, world-class superstars. But I would hesitate to call them Red Bull discoveries, given that Mercedes was in for Verstappen. BMW also had, uh, let's say, a share in Sebastian Vettel. They'd be missing a trick if they don't try and buy him out of his Williams deal. I think Colapinto's got a lot of potential. He's just, he's learning the ropes at the moment and he's going to crash. It's just the fact that, if he's in F1 next season, he's still doing it. That's when the issue is. 
But is there an issue that he finds the limit very quickly and maybe it's too quickly and he needs to ease off a little bit and, and take a bit longer to find the limit? Or is it something to do with that car? Because that car has crashed a lot this season. Yeah, that's sort of what I think is going to be a, a worry for, for Williams more, more so than, than Colo Pinto in terms of their situation. We're obviously going to next year try and dial that out of their, their car. But yeah, he, he has found the limit and found the limit quickly, but that's a positive. So I, I still think it hasn't derailed the hype train for him. Um, but where it all fits in is it sort of relies a little bit on the Red Bull situation and whether they need or want to keep one of their headline drivers and what they do with their sponsors there and how oh, how they may be interested in another sort of driver. I, th- I think there's been examples of drivers that have found the limit sooner. <laughs> um, you know, Logan being one of them. <laughs> the thing was, the, the reason that he's no longer in that seat is because that he didn't learn from it this season. That's the perils there. It's, yeah, cool. You, you've not got free reign to crash as much as you can the first year, but you're going to have a few in your first few races it's about how you deal with that and dial back from it um i remember you know back in 2021 for example when sonoda scored in his first race ross braun was saying i think he's the most impressive rookie i've seen in a very long time what followed was yuki under delivering and i think after imola having quite a few crashes but franz toss kept, kept faith in him and now he's I would say delivering pretty much every week he still has the old off weekend but I'd say he's delivering most weekends now um, and I think you can any rookie really you can name will have those moments there it's the drivers that don't find the limit in their first season are the ones that usually underperform and end up disappearing into the sunset very early I guess you've got to be careful at a team like Williams with a cost cap and things like this I mean Pierre Gasly we know that he's the, 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 the best driver when it comes to protecting the car he's not cost his team anything at all over the course of the season which is a phenomenal feat and I, th- I guess maybe teams like Williams need to say to their drivers it's great you find the limit but can you just spin off and not hit anything that'd be great please because we can't keep dipping our hands into our pockets um, I've got another question this isn't actually a question from a fan but I want to put it to you both very quickly because uh, JBL we had a chat on Monday about the F1 announcement from General Motors or that General Motors are going to be on the 2026 grid with a Cadillac entry. Uh, this came as a bit of a, a part of a restructuring plan from the original idea uh, that Cadillac uh, launched back with the Andretti entry, which F1 rejected, as we know. Uh, this led to Michael Andretti departing, this is a long question, by the way, uh, departing from day-to-day running of the Andretti or from the Andretti group. Now, John Noble's written uh, a story outlining that the Andretti name is still going to be part of the project with the news that Mario Andretti is being brought in as a director uh, on the board of the Cadillac operation. First of all, it's a kind of a twin question will this be a surprise to formula one and hayden for you how important is it do you think that mario andretti is going to be involved and what would he bring to the project start with you on the first question jbl and then we'll uh, well, I, I i don't know it's it's a ceremony ceremonial position really isn't it I, th- I don't think it will change f1's opinion of it ultimately this is still a gm led cadillac entry that's got you know financiers that were involved in the Andretti project um yeah sure Mario's got a lot of pull he's still got the Andretti name but I don't think it will change their view of it so much yeah I I agree I think it provides a nice sort of heritage link if you can call it obviously there's not a great deal of that in the GM Cadillac from a Formula 1 perspective perspective, but you did have that with the Andretti link Uh, granted the the Mario link is a lot stronger than than the Michael Andretti with all due respect to his Formula 1 racing career but regardless I think that will be a nice story that they can work with and and go with and and in in fairness it ties it all up quite quite nicely um, and gives pretty much everyone what they want I'm very I'm moving this on slightly from the question but I'm very then uh, interested to see how uh, which we'll find out in the coming days in Qatar, how the, the teams reacted to this, because forever and a day it was, oh, never never in my life, my board will never allow this, we'll have no money left because of a new team, this, that and the other. In Vegas it was all a bit, like, oh, maybe it'll be fine. So I'm assuming some sort of dilution fee of many, many millions of dollars has been uh, agreed or an equivalent sort of payout to suddenly them go, ah, oh, it's... It's not the bad, worst idea in the world. It's another OEM, all, all these sudden positive things that were all largely still there previously, not quite, not so explicit. But yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see how 
they react to it and, and where we go from there. But for, for overall, it's, it's great news for Formula One. Yeah, great news to have two extra spots on the grid all of a sudden for 26. And who takes those spaces? And when do we get a 12th team? <laughs> 24 cars, let's keep going. <laughs> I would love it. car grid, wouldn't it be fantastic? Look, gents, thank you very much indeed, as always. There you go. That's it for another one of our Autosport Q&A episodes. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you like and subscribe to stay up to date with all of our content and put your comments in as well so we know what you think from what these two gents have said. If you want to get your questions in, well, keep an eye out on Instagram and on YouTube as well and look out for our call out on autosport.com. Com. That's going to happen at the start of next week where you get your questions in the post-Qatar Grand Prix episode coming next Wednesday. Until then, though, thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-bang.